Hello, I'm Patrick Reynolds. And I'm Michael Albany, and welcome to episode three of Sex Ed. That's S-E-C-T-S Ed. In our last two episodes, we started out right away by inviting you to join us hundreds of years in the past. But today, we want to begin with a current event, a piece of news from just earlier this year. On January 2nd, 2017, Sister Frances Carr, one of the last three members of the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing, passed away. With her death at the age of 89, Brother Arnold Had and Sister June Carpenter are all that remains of the sect more commonly known as the Shakers that was, for a time, prominent in the religious landscape of the United States. This week, we thought it would be appropriate to pay our respects to Sister Frances by delving into the history and beliefs of the society that she belonged to, the Shakers. Over the course of this program, we'll explore how the Shakers established themselves in the United States and how they worship God in ways unique from other Christian groups. We'll also talk about the significant impact Shakers have made in the wider secular world. But first, let's go back and talk about how the Shakers came to be. Well, as we go back to start with the origins of the Shaker movement, we're going to have to start with one woman, Anne Lee. Lee, who would later become known as Mother Anne, was born in Manchester, England on February 29th, 1736. Uh, she was the daughter of a blacksmith, so a member of the city's working class, and at a very young age she started working in a cotton factory and ended up being pretty begrudgingly married to a blacksmith uh, with whom she had four children. All four children died in infancy, and in light of these tragic circumstances, it kind of makes sense why she would seek solace in spiritual forces. Anne Lee did not, however, belong to the Anglican Church, which was England's predominant Christian denomination. Instead, she became involved with James and Jane Wardley, uh, who were a couple who had founded a modest Christian sect that was largely modeled after the Society of Friends, also known as Quakers. And their religious services were also very similar to Quaker meetings, but the Wardleys were prone to a sort of ecstatic undulations, which were supposedly brought about by the power of the Holy Spirit, which could be called shaking. And out of this group of so-called shaking Quakers, Anne Lee quickly rose to prominence. She claimed to experience visions, particularly of an imminent second coming of Christ. Such pronouncements, uh, coupled with her use of shaking and dancing and worship, earned her the enmity of the Church of England and English authorities alike. So facing persecution for her belief, she revealed in 1774 a vision she had that would alter the course of her movement forever. Mother Anne told her followers that their place was not in the metropole of the, of the British Empire, but in one of its colonies across the Atlantic that, in only two years' time, uh, would declare its independence. Thus, she and seven followers embarked for New York City that year. Upon arriving, their initial mission was to lay low and not draw attention to themselves. Uh, during this period, they acquired a property northwest of Albany and resettled there. Mother Anne and her followers may have remained there, uh, sort of in historical obscurity, had it not been for the events of May 19, 1780, New England's infamous Dark Day. The Dark Day was uh, approximately a 24-hour period where several colonies along the Atlantic coast were just mysteriously blanketed by clouds of darkness. Uh, modern scientists theorize that this is likely a result of smoke clouds caused by forest fires, but this did not stop observers at the time from seeking answers from higher powers. Mother Anne thought that this was the best time to open the gospel, to reveal to a wider audience some of the group's beliefs, and she started dedicating more energy to proselytizing. So what were her group's beliefs? Let's start by looking at their name. Mother Anne and her followers refer to themselves as the United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing. This means that they foresaw the reappearance of Jesus Christ in their lifetimes, though not necessarily in a male form. According to one Shaker text, In the fullness of time, according to the unchangeable purpose of God, the same spirit and word of power which created man at the beginning, which dwelt inside the man Jesus, was revealed in a woman, and that woman was Anne Lee. Now, it's important to clarify here that Mother Anne did not consider herself a reincarnation of Jesus, and her followers didn't consider that either. Instead, the Shakers upheld that Mother Anne was the spiritual analog of Jesus. The Shakers, after all, believe that God is genderless, but at the same time exhibits equal parts male and female characteristics. Therefore, just as he had a male manifestation of his presence on earth that was the body of Jesus Christ, they thought it was also possible for him to have a female manifestation as well. And as said manifestation, Mother Anne was undisputably the church leader, making the Shakers even more unique among the prominently masculine early American Protestants. Definitely um, not encountering a lot of, of female leaders of these sects. Now we'll talk more about Shaker belief soon enough, but for now let's focus on how Shakerism spread in the 1780s. 
The mother Anne is often remembered for her grace and piety. It should not be forgotten that she was also quite shrewd. She realized that would be difficult to build and sustain a religious movement uh, pr practically from the ground up. So she instead capitalized on one of the connections uh, of an early convert. In the winter of 1780, shortly after Mother Anne opened her gospel, a man named Daniel Wood arrived in New York. He had previously been a follower of Shadrach Ireland, who uh, quite honestly deserves his own sex ed episode. Ireland was a religious leader based in Massachusetts uh, who had amassed a small but devout following. And he preached that it was possible for humans to attain such a level of spiritual perfection that they could actually become immortal. And I believe his uh, actual group referred to themselves as perfectionists and this whole this whole paradigm of perfectionism that is one that the shakers uh sort of align with but differ from in other ways yeah, it sounds uh, like they definitely have more of a societal perfect well they're utopian so rather than perfecting themselves it's perfecting their society that they're making as we're gonna see later yeah so as opposed to uh I think utopian is one of the best words to describe it. The Shaker's form of perfection was perfection in the way in which you live your life before death, whereas for Shadrach Ireland, uh, he believed that you could become so perfect that death no longer applied to you. Which, I mean, is, is a pretty common concept in Christianity, but not physically while you're still walking around. <laughs> Absolutely. The immortality is not to be confused with that of everlasting mm -hmm. life, um, but instead, literally, you live forever. Despite Ireland's claims that he himself became immortal, uh, in 1778, he died. Uh, and so with their leader gone, many Irelandites remained in the Square House, which is the name for the house that they had built uh, in Harvard, Massachusetts, as the base of their operations. Meanwhile, others wandered in search of new spiritual guidance. Daniel Wood just happened upon the guidance of Mother Anne. Sending him to Harvard as her first missionary, Mother Anne quickly established a foothold in New England. And it made sense to appeal to the Irelandites. Uh, not only did they have experience as religious outsiders, uh, making them more susceptible to a group that uh, didn't necessarily fall into Protestant orthodoxy, as many early Americans would have understood it. But they also owned property that would have proved vital for future missionary work. Basically, um, the Shakers would have had a base of operations themselves around which they could then um, formulate new missionary networks. So the Shakers wasted little time in purchasing the square house uh, from the Ireland Knights. And from this center, Shakerism spread and was received especially well by many women. Shakers, after all, followed a female leader and professed the members of both sexes were equal in the eyes of God. They granted women a degree of gender equality that was uh, practically unmatched by the more prominent denominations of the American colonies. By 1781, the Shakers had gained over 400 converts and were growing by the day. And actually, 400 is probably a modest estimate, as it's an estimate that... Uh, I discovered being one that the president of Yale uh, at the time had written. Well, not all New Englanders were welcoming of the Shakers. So with the Revolutionary War going on, many viewed the movement's British origins as suspicious. One Congregationalist minister even claimed that Shakers were sent over into America by ministerial connections to excite confusion and religious disturbance and to propagate principles against fighting and resisting Britain. Indeed. The Shakers embraced pacifism, a fact that would become controversial again during the Civil War. However, what raised even more eyebrows was the style of worship that they practiced. So rather than expressing their devotion to God in still and silent prayer, the Shakers, like the Wardleys before them, uh, incorporated dance and music. And although the Shakers did not publish any of their music until 1812 with the hymnal called Millennial Praises, it's widely known that they were writing tunes with rhythms and lyrics even into the 1780s. So when passers-by heard the unfamiliar sounds coming out of these Shaker meeting places, many feared sinister works were afoot, and there were even accusations of witchcraft. And definitely I think it's worth noting the millennial in that uh, is, is millennialism, not the uh, generation that gets complained about. It's, it's essentially tied into apocalyptic sects. It's that they believe there's going to be some great change in society or the world, or 
something's going to happen that's major that shifts. Yeah. This is the vaguest way, I guess, I can try and define it. So It's not necessarily all Christian either, but it mostly refers to Christians. So it's not so much apocalyptic in the sense that the world is definitely going to end, but it is a group that believes that within their lifetimes or mm -hmm. within a coming generation, they are going to see a major change that uh, sort of brings about a new order yeah. on earth it's i mean they definitely can be apocalyptic too some of them are but it's these are the the end is not people certainly even though there's a very wide range of what that looks like to all these different groups but just as a general category it's expecting the return of jesus christ imminently they're any day now they're waiting for it they usually will pick a date in some of the group well I don't know if the Shakers do or not, but um, groups like Jehovah's Witnesses, eventually that become Jehovah's Witnesses, are known for, like, this is the date. It should come as a little surprise, then, that early Shakers were subjected to both persecution and physical violence, especially in the communities of Harvard and Shirley, Massachusetts. As the Revolutionary War was drawing to a close in 1783, military men were returning to these towns, and they brought with them memories of their commanding officers issuing floggings to instill order in their troops. Essentially, the use of the cat and nine tails was the way that both the British and then later the American uh, armies maintained discipline uh, amongst troops. And this would have been something that for veterans of the Revolutionary War, they would have been incredibly familiar with, uh, either by receiving such punishment themselves or just witnessing it. Because, of course, one of the points of such a graphic display uh, of violence through the Cat of Nine Tails was to display it publicly. Let your troops know that if you get out of order, this is the sort of consequence you could face. Several accounts survive of angry mobs using similar tactics on nearby Shakers. Two of Mother Anne's followers from Manchester, James Whitaker and her brother William Lee, were victims of a particularly grisly attack in Harvard. As one Shaker author recounts, quote, Father James was tied to a tree and scourged until the ground was wet with his blood. Father William requested that he take his whipping on his knees, and this was granted. But Father James, uh, freed from the tree to which he had been tied, left upon Father William, thus shielding his brother by means of his own lacerated back, end quote. I think what should be taken from this account is the degree to which Shakers were willing to endure bodily harm for the sake of their faith. Essentially, this was a group that was willing to endure persecution and, and sort of followed that biblical precept of turning the other cheek, not fighting back when violence was administered upon them. Even Mother Anne became a target. In one instance, a bloodthirsty mob surrounded a house where she was staying, forcing her to spend an entire night hidden in a small closet that was concealed uh, behind a dresser. And this is interesting that in the early days when Mother Anne's still around that this violence is going on, because... Especially these days when people talk about the Shakers, that there's a lot of like, oh, everyone loves them. So this is definitely, it's, it'll be interesting to see, I guess, over the course of the podcast, how, how patterns reemerge uh, over and over. But just the, the persecution in the early days when they're a bit more fiery, maybe, in their rhetoric, when they're, when they're new and people aren't used to them as much. Right, and that's sort of... Because later on, as they start getting established, things become fine, essentially, as we're going to see when the Civil War comes around. There's controversies, but this dies down, does it not? Certainly, and uh, I think that, especially during the revolutionary period of American history, you saw just a confluence of different factors working mm -hmm. against the Shakers, this idea that uh, you had uh, people who had experienced violence as uh, they had experienced war coming back home. They're seeing new and unfamiliar peoples and um, certainly other elements of the ways that the Shakers live their lives would have, again, raised eyebrows. And we'll talk more about that uh, mm -hmm. a bit later. But um, And I mean, for the Revolutionary War, too, that's what I think we, we mentioned it, but the fact that they were refusing to fight and were coming over from England made them quite a target. Sure. They were uh, often, uh, and this is not only in the Revolutionary War, but as we'll see in other conflicts throughout American history, their decision, their theologically ingrained decision to 
not pick up arms was seen by many as a means of cowardice, especially because uh, if you were wanting to be a member of the Republic, the idea was that being a citizen of the Republic meant that you would be willing to take up arms for the Republic. It's the and, active passive citizen sort of mindset a little bit. Yeah, the sort of opposition to Shaker pacifism, at least early on, was very much ingrained in this idea of sort of Jeffersonian citizenship. The idea that the United States is a nation of uh, farmers who would rise up whenever the Republic was in jeopardy. Shakers were not willing to do that. So these attacks took a great toll on the Shaker leadership, and in the fall of 1783, several Shaker elders returned to their old property in New York. There, William Lee died the following June, along with Mother Anne shortly after. She was 48 years old. Though many sources suggest that Mother Anne died of natural causes, most Shaker scholars and the Shakers themselves believe that the extreme stress brought on by all the religious persecution had shortened her life. Thus, she is considered a martyr for her cause. With Mother Anne's passing, control of the church was briefly handed down to James Whitaker until his own death in 1787. Then, the Shakers entered a new age with the ascendance of Father Joseph Meacham and Mother Lucy Wright, the first American-born Shaker leaders. Meacham and Wright together shaped Shakerism in a number of important ways. Uh, one of Meacham's transformative goals, for example, was the establishment of a gospel order. With the Shakers now spread throughout New England, he believed it was best to reorganize into more concentrated communities uh, where the Shakers could worship and live their lives unimpeded by the outside world. So you can view the Shakers as being a part of this rising religious trend in the uh, especially in the early 19th century, of communal groups. The other one that comes to mind is the Oneida community, uh, although they are very different from the Shakers in the fact that uh, their sort of communal life was based around free love, as we will see, absolutely not the case for the Shakers. But the Shakers, after all, aimed for a life of simplicity, and they staunchly adhered to celibacy, which had been a central tenet of Shaker theology since the time of Mother Anne. As a side note, I think it's interesting that much like how early Mormons faced violent reprisals based on rumors of polygamy, the Shakers were sometimes targeted for their refusal to marry and have children. So it wasn't necessarily in many cases that the specific religious practices brought about opposition from the outside world, but sort of their refusal to adhere to societal norms of what the nuclear family should be. As part of the gospel order, each Shaker community would be governed by a church family or a center family. This was a group of Shaker elders that was particularly devout and which would agree to renounce all their earthly possessions and ties to the outside world. In return, they would live closest to the meeting house, which was the Shaker house of worship. Then you had other family units named after where they lived in proximity to the meeting house. There'd be a north or a south family, for example, or a family named after a location in their village. But these were not biological families, because remember, the Shakers embraced total celibacy. In fact, in cases where Shakers converted entire families, which was quite common, parents and children would be separated and shuffled around into different units. Uh, the idea was to instill a sense of separateness from human bonds. For Shakers, the only powerful bond of love you were supposed to have was to God. This goal of separateness extended even to gender separateness, as most buildings in the Shaker communities were designed to be inhabited by one gender at a time. And it's for this reason that you have to seriously evaluate what gender equality means in Shakerism. For Shakers, men and women were spiritually equal. Uh, female Shakers could also assume leadership positions that didn't exist in other Christian denominations. However, there were still divisions between men and women based on the type of work they did. And the type of work people were doing were gonna, is going to be very important. Because there's a lot of how they define themselves in relationship to and in terms of the work that they do. Absolutely. Prayer and work were the two most all-encompassing facets of 19th century Shaker communal life. Uh, a summer day for a Shaker would begin at around 5 a.m., and proceed with only a few breaks for meals until 8 p.m., during which time women were largely tasked with domestic chores, cooking, cleaning, textile production, uh, and things like that. Uh, meanwhile, men would be involved in farming uh, and smithing, and as you get later on into the 19th century and more industrial uh, forms of labor become prominent, uh, they'd also become mechanics and involved in technological work like that. 
One of the main reasons Shakers worked so hard was because their communities were supposed to be self-sustaining. They wanted to maintain as much distance from the distractions of the outside world as possible. Remember, though, that the Shakers shouldn't be misconstrued with groups like the Amish, who were dedicated to removing themselves from the outside world in the technological sense. Because Shakers were not completely isolated. In fact, built into Meacham's gospel order was the leadership position of deacon, which was later renamed to trustee. Uh, and this person was tasked with managing each community's financial matters. Shakers did not shy away from the possibility of making money to improve their villages, since perfection in all things was one of their missions. Thus, they produced surplus goods for sale uh, in the outside world, uh, including seed packs. So, if you've ever went to the store and seen a pack of seeds in a little paper envelope, Shakers were the group who pioneered that. And of course, you see the emergence of other Shaker industries, far too numerous for us to get into in this podcast, but everything from furniture production uh, to Shaker fancy work, which was often practiced by women. Um, Clothes pins. Of course. Yeah, they, they came up with quite a bit. They were industrious, if nothing else. Um, so Meacham died in 1796. He would only witness the results of his gospel order for a short time. While complications on the group often prevented his communal plans from rising to his ideals, there were a lot of successes in a number of different respects. So soon the Shakers were attracting more converts, not simply based on their religious teachings, but because their communities were such an attractive place to live. Uh, these were really clean and well-ordered, and the Shakers promised to take care of their own even once they became infirm. And uh, there eventually emerged a group that became known as the Winter Shakers. Basically, this referred to travelers or vagabonds who, when they had nowhere else to go for the winter, would join a Shaker community. And then when the spring thaw would come, they'd all go out on their own way. And even though this was not ideal for Shakers, and they knew what was going on with these people who would come in just for the winter, uh, existing sources suggest that they just took it in stride and just took care of them because that's what they did. And it's it's interesting to me the way that there's sort of a balance between how isolated they are between their utopian communities where everyone's following these rules and living together, but there is a bit of, of back and forth from the community because obviously they're being celibate, these self-sustaining communities, the populations aren't going to be self-sustaining. And you get influxes of new ideas and new people coming in that stop them from getting isolated in the way that much later cults, uh, groups that we think of like Jonestown, those are the situations that get really bad is when they're, you know, out in the jungle, totally isolated. And I think based on the fact that you do have a group that is based on celibacy, you are going to have a constant influx of new people who are bringing new experiences with them. Because remember, the only way, uh, if you have a celibate group, the only way you can reproduce your numbers is through recruitment. And there's also, I mean, people who abandon the Shakers, who, who go out of these communities too, and go back into the wider communities, and they presumably would have stories of, oh, everyone took care of everyone there, and they had all the, it was all really nice and clean and well-ordered, and they have nice things to say about the Shakers after they leave, even if they can't deal with the celibacy for long. And from what I've read, the ones who were most likely uh, to leave Shaker communities were those who uh, were brought there as children. So in instances where you had entire families uh, convert to Shakerism and then the children began to grow up, uh, or in instances where Shakers would adopt children, which was a common means of recruiting new members. Uh, they would go to orphanages uh, and adopt children. In fact, that's the way that Sister Frances, who recently passed away, that's how she became a Shaker. At the age of 10, uh, she, was, she was an orphan. She was adopted it in. And of course, the Shakers did integrate children into their daily lives. In fact, there were, uh, in 1815, the Shakers began to run schools in their communities. They had documents set up for the ways that children should be living their lives. But ultimately, uh, as you grow up, you start to have the autonomy to choose what sort of uh, life that you want to live. And for many, this was not for them. Uh, and so... And I feel like from what I've been able to read, I mean, I, I'm assuming it, it fluctuates because they're around for a long time and there's, you know, everyone's got different opinions, but for the most part, it seems like the, when children grew up and decided they wanted to leave, there wasn't ill will towards that. They were just sort of, yeah, we know this lifestyle isn't for everyone. Right. It's sort of, I would say it's analogous in some sort of ways to the ways that the, uh, the Amish give their children an opportunity to leave. Basically, Armstrong. 
what's that? Room spring up. There you go. So, uh, and during that period, you know, children have a chance to go out of the Amish community and they get to experience the world and they get to decide, okay, do I want to live that way or do I want to live this way? Although it's not as ingrained in the Shakers because they have this sort of abiding spirit of charity. So even though there are formally set in sort of ways in which the Shaker families are supposed to interact with the world. You know, uh, you're supposed to sort of get permission from the church family if you want to leave from the community for extended periods of time, things like that. There's always going to be complications on the ground. There's always going to be uh, that human factor that the dogma and the religious texts can't mm -hmm. necessarily account for. And it sounds like um, one thing that's just interesting about the Shakers in comparison to the groups we've done before is that as, as sort of a utopian social experiment and religion sort of at the same time, there's a lot of their beliefs aren't necessarily that fringe. It's just the level to which they pursue these beliefs and put them into practice and the experiments that they have for, okay, we're going to go and live in this way together that really are one of the main things that set them apart. Although they do have a lot of unique things, like the, the dualism, um, believing that God is male and female, but is genderless, um, things like that do definitely set them apart theologically, but a lot of these seem to be social experiment related to putting theology in practice. That's, it seems really practical, um, practical applications of theology. <laughs> sure. <laughs> So after Meacham's death, his compatriot Lucy Wright uh, became the sole leader of the church, just as the period known as the Second Great Awakening was taking shape. Now until this point, the Shakers had become geographically stagnant. Their major population centers were limited to places like New England and New York. Wright changed this by instigating a new series of evangelizing efforts into what would become known as the Shaker West. So she began by calling for more Shaker publications to disseminate their teachings, uh, and this included the Testimony of Christ's Second Appearing, which we've quoted earlier and which she helped produce. It was also during this period that Shakers began to publish music they used in their religious services, and songs proved effective proselytizing tools because they could reach an illiterate audience and they'd stick in people's heads. Uh, in fact, one of the most enduring Shaker tunes is Simple Gifts, which endures and shaker music often had these recurring themes of simplicity and purity that would stick in people's heads. Yeah. And uh, we're going to definitely include a couple clips in the show notes too that you can check out. Yeah. The revival efforts Wright organized proved incredibly successful. During her tenure of leadership, four new shaker communities arose uh, in Ohio, along with two in Kentucky and one in Indiana. And this is pretty much as far west as shaker communities managed to reach in the United States. Also, I uh, should note that the shaking that they get their name from, the, the sort of uh, ecstatic dancing, particularly that was a, a hallmark of, of Mother Anne. After her death uh, and during this time period, it starts to shift into more organized and more uh, sort of scripted dances as opposed to spontaneous things inspired by the Holy Spirit. It becomes more ritualized and traditional and they have steps. Sort of like the way that Shakers live their lives in a very ordered, very uh, measured way. The Shaker worship services, which incorporated dancing, these were often dances that meant utilization of sort of geographic patterns, men and women getting in uh, squares and things like that. So there was a clear order to this, very different than, say, your sort of services for like Seventh-day Adventists, where the Holy Spirit is supposed to come upon you. Spontaneously, yeah. yeah. So it definitely seems like Wright and Meacham were had a big influence in terms of just organizing things quite a bit from, from where they'd begun. But Wright died in 1821, which triggered a minor crisis among the Shakers' upper echelons. In particular, several Shaker men considered this as a signal that they should begin loosening their beliefs about gender equality. One elder from the community of New Lebanon, New York, though, argued that Mother Lucy's work was to establish and support uh, an equality in the church between brethren and sisters, so that they have the same rights as they have ever had when she was with us. So these attempts to reduce the emphasis on gender equality did not gain significant traction. This would prove a prudent choice as time went on, and women began to demographically dominate in Shaker communities. By the 1870s, in fact, most Shaker villages were made up of one-third men and two-thirds women. 
What did change in the wake of Wright's death was the church leadership structure. So no longer would there be a single leader like Mother Anne had been. Uh, instead, the Shakers would be led by a council of elders and a series of governing documents called the Millennial Laws that essentially acted as codes of conduct. For years following Wright's death, the Shakers maintained a comfortable place in American society that included frequent interactions with the world outside their communal villages. Again, though, this would change. In 1837, a group of girls in a New York village purportedly experienced visions, and this was astonishing for many Shakers who believed that only Mother Anne and Joseph Meachin possess gifts of revelation. Nevertheless, more reports of visions emerged as the Shakers moved into a phase of their history known as the Era of Manifestations, or Mother Anne's work. Now, before considering the spiritual dimensions of this era, it's important to understand that the late 1830s were a period of transition for the Shakers. Many of the people that Mother Anne and her English disciples had converted were beginning to pass away. For some, this meant losing important connections to the past and the legacy of the Shaker founder. Furthermore, Shaker communities were becoming more and more entangled in earthly matters because of their economic interactions with the rest of the world. And it was in this context that Shakers began to have their first visions. And what did, what did Shakers call everybody else? They, they had some phrase that was like... They said the world. They just called them the world? It was world. the world, capital W. Okay, so the world with a capital W. Shakers who claimed to experience visions were called instruments because uh, for a time their bodies acted as conduits for angels or spirits. And when they were being used as spiritual instruments, believers would shake and undulate much more than was customary during worship. Remember, by the 19th century, uh, visions introduced a certain degree of chaos into Shaker services again. And so much so, they actually decided to close their prayer meetings from public viewing. And it got to the point where you would even start to see signs erected that warned members of the world, that is the world with a capital W, the outside world that was not the Shaker village, to warn them away. And these signs uh, basically looked like railroad crossing signs. You had a big post with an X and then various warnings just saying that this is uh, where Shaker meetings are taking place and to not enter here. We'll include a picture of that in the show notes. Some of the figures Shakers reported seeing included biblical prophets. A Harvard Shaker, for example, claimed uh, to have been visited by a prophet from the Book of Chronicles who revealed that the square house that Mother Aunt had purchased from the Irelandites had primeval origins. He proclaimed, quote, it has ever been a place of peculiar delight to the ancient patriarchs, because it is a place where Blessed Mother performs so many of her labors. And we bow in reverence uh, when we pass it in commemoration of her sufferings and the sufferings of those faithful witnesses who stood with her, end quote. Essentially, this prophet revealed that Mother Anne was destined to reside uh, in the house, making it consecrated shaker ground. Along with biblical prophets, some instruments said that they interceded with historical figures. According to one believer, William Penn, the founder of Pennsylvania, converted from being a Quaker to a shaker in the afterlife. During an 1843 Shaker meeting, an anonymous observer recounted how multiple Shakers apparently witnessed Mother Anne leading a group of indigenous peoples through their meeting house. The Indians lived before Columbus's journey across the Atlantic. The era of manifestations lasted until the 1850s when Shakers decided to re-enter the arena of worldly affairs. Artifacts surviving from these decades of visionary fervor include the gift drawings some instruments produced artistically as renderings of their experiences. Gift drawings are rather hard to come by, though, as some artists came to look upon them as embarrassing and impractical and eventually destroyed them. There's a lot of, uh, there's, I mean, since making things, as we're going to talk about later, became really central and, and the work that they did in the physical world had religious dimensions to it, there's a lot of objects, there's a lot of material culture that goes along with them that can be studied. And there's some great Shaker museums, but maybe you We'll talk about that later already. Yeah, and one other historical counter I came upon uh, in my research is you had one shaker who claimed to have been visited by the spirit of George Washington, who said that uh, he had actually fought the American Revolution to ensure religious protection of groups like the shakers. One way that the Shakers still refused to interact with the outside world, though, was through warfare. As stated previously, the Shakers were pacifists who did not serve in the Revolutionary War and even risked jail time by not fighting in the War of 1812. By the outbreak of the Civil War, their stance had not changed. What did change was that they now had legal protection for their religious convictions. 
President Lincoln allowed Shaker men to abstain from the conflict as conscientious objectors. Nevertheless, Shakers did participate in the Civil War in some ways. Uh, before the fighting began, some Shaker communities pooled their money together to purchase the freedom of enslaved African Americans. And for these newly freed peoples, they could either join in to Shaker communities or they could go upon their way. Uh, during the war, they opened their homes as well to wary Union and Confederate soldiers. Nevertheless, they largely appeared on the ideological side of the Union, especially uh, because of their opposition to slavery. One way in which the Shaker participation in the Civil War became a bit controversial was when you had groups like the Shirley Shakers who would go to places like Virginia and Washington, D.C., and they would actually sell goods uh, to the military. They would sell food, they would sell drink, by drink I do mean like wine, to the soldiers, and you had accusations from many that this was sort of a hypocritical thing for them to do, to basically claim conscientious objector status and not fight in the Civil War, but sort of profit off of it by selling to the military. But for many of the Shakers, they believe that this was a sort of justifiable thing to do because their mission in life was uh, sort of a one of spiritual perfection and so while fighting military service was not conducive to that providing for peoples in wartime was after the civil war the shakers numbers began to fall one reason for this was economic even though the shakers did not shy away from modern technology and as we mentioned uh, invented some things themselves, their predominant focus was on agrarianism, and they failed to incite as many converts uh, as the industrial age picked up. Furthermore, their adherence to celibacy ensured that they could never just reproduce their numbers and could only acquire new members through conversion. And those who came to Shaker villages as children uh, were more and more likely to leave uh, than those who converted as adults. All these factors combined and led to the closure of more and more Shaker communities until today only one remains active at Sabbath Day Lake in Maine. I definitely think there's probably a factor of the industrialization of America basically making their goods less valuable, um, less less able to compete uh, with this sort of utopian handmade work that they're so famous for today. Essentially, as industrialization makes sort of goods easier and easier to produce, the handcrafted works become less coveted. For example, shaker chairs. Shaker chairs were one of the big industries for these communities, and if you have a shaker chair, as anyone who collects sort of shaker artifacts will tell you, they will last a while. The mission of any shaker craftsman, any shaker architect, they were going to build things that could last a hundred years, and uh, that sort of conviction is reinforced by the fact that you still have Shaker artifacts from the 19th century that look just as well today as they probably did then. Nevertheless, if your choice is between a chair that is maybe not the best made, but cheaper, versus a more expensive Shaker chair, the choices you make are different. Um, There's also the factor of just if they've made a chair that's lasting for 100 years, they're selling one, and that's it. There's no... <laughs> There's no sort of ingrained obsolescence that you see in sort of modern industry. Uh, nevertheless, again, another way that the Shakers are different than groups like, say, the Amish, they're still integrating modern technology into their lifestyle. Uh, you see electricity going up in Shaker communities. You see them riding cars, uh, everything like that. Pretty much the only things that really stay the same are sort of the structures in which shakers are living, their architecture, uh, and the way they're dressing. So that's one of the reasons I think sometimes shakers are confused uh, with groups like the Amish or the Mennonites. You see a very plain style of dress, but that's simply a manifestation of them trying to live lives very simple and very plainly. So nevertheless, Brother Arnold and Sister June keep the spirit of the shakers alive, even maintaining a website detailing their principles and beliefs. Before Sister Frances died in January, she even maintained hope that the Shakers would grow again, and I uh, don't see any reason why Brother Arnold and Sister June wouldn't accept new converts who mentioned uh, 
and interest uh, in this group. If you want to learn more about them uh, or even show your financial support, you can visit their website, www.mainshakers.com. You can also visit one of several surviving Shaker villages that exist today uh, as historic sites. Some of the ones that immediately come to mind uh, are the Hancock Shaker Village in Massachusetts, as well as the Shaker Village of Pleasant Hill, which is in Kentucky. And as I mentioned, I mean, I think briefly earlier, definitely a lot of, of just great museums. And with that, we'd like to close on this episode of Sex Ed. That's Sex with a C-T-S. Um, you can find Sex Ed at Sex Ed on Twitter and on Facebook. Like us, follow us, uh, and you can email us at sexed at gmail.com if you have any comments, questions, uh, anything you'd like to add, or any uh, sex that you'd like us to cover. You'll hear from us again in two weeks when we cover a more modern group known as Heaven's Gate. So join us then for the episode four, Gate Expectations. This episode of Sex Ed was researched, written, produced, and presented by Michael Albany and Patrick Reynolds, and was edited by Patrick Reynolds. Sex Ed is created under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. It was recorded at Leader the Lab for the Education and Advancement in Digital Research at Michigan State University. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily represent those of Michigan State University or any of its affiliates. Thanks for listening. Bye. I don't know what to say. I don't okay. think I have to say anything. I think that's a good way to just end it. keep on trucking. Yeah, I think this is good, but did that sound right? Yeah. Okay. And just keep on keeping on, y'all. Coolio? <laughs> I'm trying to find good sign-offs, but they're all for emails. Oh, well.